So we're going to look into the diencephalon and the limbic system. All right, so the story. Three blind men trying to describe an elephant. One of them touched the elephant and said, the elephant is like a tree. The other one touched the elephant and said, the elephant is like a wall. Another one touched the elephant and said, it's like a large snake. What was the first one touching? What did he say? A tree. What? It was touching a leg. Uh, one was touching, it said it was like a wall. What was he feeling? Body. The body or the side of it. One was said it was like a large snake was feeling the trunk of the elephant. Which one was right? They were all right. But they were all different perspectives and all different angles and they were all bringing this in. The reason I'm showing you all these different pictures of the brain, this is of course the lateral view, this is sagittal. This portion of the brain is, do you guys remember what this is called? It's a... Coro yeah, coronal plane. It is It is basically if, as though we cut the brain in half, probably right about here. And we're, we're, we turn it this way and we're looking into it. And this one is kind of like a see-through to see the limbic system and other portions of the brain like that. What I'd like to start with is the thalamus. And I'm going to try to give you a couple to three different perspectives on where these are. The thalamus is this egg shape right in here. And you're like, okay, well that makes sense. Well, let me show you a couple more angles so you can appreciate some things about the thalamus. Okay. This is, yeah. Say limbic system. Limbic system. We're gonna write it in our notes here in just a second. Uh huh. Which is not an actual system of the body. It's more That's of a system. Yeah. Oh, no, we, we're that one. Yeah, within the brain itself. It's yeah, like cardiovascular. That wasn't one of the twelve. <laughs> okay. Now down here, the thalamus is this and this. So it's actually two pairs of these egg-shaped structures here. Okay. And then in here, the thalamus is this guy. And it may help, and if you if you dig doing it this way, it may help to do this with some colored pencils. So you can look at that as you kind of go through. And you can do that later if you want. So the thalamus is this region of the brain. And there's a lot of ways we can look at it and a lot of functions that we know about it and still don't know about the thalamus. But this is how I sum it up. It is the editor of information to the cerebral cortex. Editor of information to the cerebral cortex. Okay. What that means is this. For us to actually process anything, to feel anything, to hear anything, to see anything, it's got to get out to here. This gray matter and the outer layer. And if you remember from our first primer, the cortex is the outer layer of the brain. Sensory information, with the exception of smell, all has to go through here to get processed and this thing processes it and decides whether or not it's worthwhile to send it to the cortex. There is a mass of information that is being sent to the thalamus that doesn't necessarily need to get out that way. If you would, if you would give me just a moment here to try to illustrate this idea. All right. When you got up this morning, most of you all you put on pants or some variation of leg coverings. I would like this row just to say the word pants over and over again. Keep going. Pants, pants, pants. pants, 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 pants keep going. Pants, 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 now, you also put on a shirt. I'd like this row to just say shirt over and over again. Shirt, shirt. Okay. Now, in this room, the temperature is 72 degrees. I would like for this row to say 72 degrees over and over again. 72 degrees, 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 72 
degrees. This is what you thalamus is processing. I want you to go burning. Burning. Okay, whoa. Did you catch that? Burning. He said burning. Okay. Bernie. <laughs> Either it's Bernie or somebody named Bernie just showed up. Well, we Either way, we need to be aware. What we're, what, we're, what we're sensing is this. If there's a change the body deems harmful, or there's something that is a really strong stimulus, the thalamus is like, oh, send this to the cortex super fast. Like you touch something hot, and all of a sudden that gets processed. Ah, that burned. Or something poked you. You ever get a splinter, you all of a sudden notice it. You can't even see it in your finger. And your, your brain's like, hey, something there hurts a lot, okay? <laughs> Thalamus is processing all this information, weeding out stuff that's not super important. But the things that are important enough went to the cortex. Now, you may or may not agree with me about this. But until I said pants, you may not have noticed the sensation of the fact that you were feeling your pants on your legs until I just drew your attention to it at that moment. Now, was it there? Yes. Was your legs uh, be, uh, sensing it? Yes. But your thalamus didn't deem it important until I drew it to your intention. Does that make sense? So there, there is processing that happens here. And this does a lot of good for weeding that out. Somebody asked me in one of my classes, do you think that, that might, there may be a lesion or something wrong with that in, in folks that have a hard time processing sensory information where, where uh, you know, like Asperger's or other syndromes like that where, or autism where uh, being touched or, or too many things going on at once is, is overwhelming? I don't know, but it was a very reasonable hypothesis. Okay, speaking of hypothesis, hypothesis is a hypothesis. A thesis is a theory. Hypo means insufficient. Why is a hypothesis an insufficient theory? Because you don't have any evidence or enough evidence. You don't have any evidence or enough evidence to back it up. So hypo means below, less than, or insufficient. And that's what we're going to look at here is something that is below the thalamus, whose name is below the thalamus. But because we're going to use the, the Latin roots, we're going to call it the hypothalamus. hypothalamus. It is that little section here. So let's try to chase that down in our other drawings so we can get all three pictures of this elephant. Okay, The hypothalamus is this tract here all the way down to that area right there. Hypothalamus. I need to finish out what I was writing about the thalamus first. I apologize. So I'll come back to that here in just a second. Hypothalamus here I want to not include this little boot down here. That little boot is something else. That's Italy. Just making sure you're paying attention. That's the pituitary gland. We'll get to that in just a minute. Okay. Go back to the thalamus. Wait, is that the hypothalamus on the hook? This little yeah. purple thing right here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Going back to the thalamus, again, I apologize for having to backtrack here, okay. Processes all sensory information except, stove students, except what? Smell. Smell, Smell bypasses this section. Uh, Just to see how far you are in your cranial nerve study, uh, which which number cranial nerve is the olfactory bulb? It's cervical nerve uh, number one. That's cervical. Uh, cer what did cranial. I do? S cranial, cervical. Why did I do that? <laughs> cervical is, wow. Thanks, viewers at home, for your patience with me. Okay, yeah, cranial as in the cranium, not cervical as in the first seven vertebrae. Okay. Is that all right. Faction? Yeah, olfaction is your sense of smell. Okay, processes all information except for smell. Um, decides, and that's I'm going to use that term rather loosely. I mean, it's not really a conscious decision. It more or less filters uh, what information. is important enough and here's the actual terminology 
to arouse the cortex. Yep, I know. Cortical arousal to actually inform or awaken, if you will, the that portion of the cortex. Okay, that's a super important job. Now, there are other jobs that you can find of the thalamus, so on and so forth. And again, that was this egg-shaped thing that we started with here, here, and there. Mr. Ellie? Yes? Does, like, stress affect the thalamus? Like, when you're in stress, you know, like, how people have high stress, you know, like, their body... Um, with the autonomic and stuff like that all messes up. Yeah. Just go to that and like block out all your other sensory information. You know, I think in some ways it makes the thalamus more highly tuned, but it can also I can see where it could mess with it, it as well. It could like cloud it. Right. All the other yeah. Information. That's a that's a great inference. I don't know that I can back it up one way or the other, but I can see it going both directions. I can see because stress helps us to sometimes focus in. You know, so our body is prepared to fight or run away. But sometimes stress keeps us from doing other tasks of processing. So I can see other, I can see other, uh, both sides of influence. It's a good question. Hold on, just one second. What is the thalamus doing when I have an episode, like a seizure? That is a fine question. Uh, my best understanding with seizures is basically, it is normally you have in the brain electrical activity where there is you know action potentials and regions of the brain that are active for certain things when we're seeing or hearing or processing or moving certain regions of the brain are activated basically a seizure is like a lightning storm of activity that occurs over pretty much the entire brain which activates a whole lot of different regions and exhausts the brain's energy resources and so there is not a specific region that's activating in a seizure. To my knowledge, it's more or less that the entire cerebrum, the entire cortex and diencephalon is all being activated, action potentials just flying across. As far as what causes them, there's still much debate and very little understanding, much to the dismay and frustration, which is why the idea of severing the corpus callosum is in is is active because basically that is the super highway of information being sent from one side to the other so it kind of they talk about trying to dampen the effect of the lightning storm by stopping it from going from one side to the other but it causes a whole slew of other effects as well it's pretty it's a pretty crude uh you know mechanism as we have because largely we're still understanding we're still trying to understand what parts of the brain do what it's not like the heart where we're like oh this chamber pumps to here it goes to there the brain is immensely complicated as is its wiring uh do you have a question yeah well about the stress thing in psychology when we were learning about memory we were talking about like short periods of stress like heighten those senses and stuff right but long periods of it like deteriorate like the yeah, we were set up to have, and we watched a video on it a little while back, we were set up to survive with periods of heightened stress and heightened uh, cortisol release and uh, epinephrine and, and norepinephrine into the bloodstream to help us to fight or run away. But we're getting to a place where people are constantly stressed out and it's having negative effects on our blood pressure, on our health, on our ability to function mentally, on our ability to sleep, on our ability to digest. And so, yeah, short term, yeah, we're, we're set up for that. But yeah, unfortunately, long term actually causes damage to the brain and anything that uses blood, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's get into the hypothalamus for just a little bit. Hypothalamus, I think, still described as the, what was it, four Fs or five Fs? Four. Okay, I'm going to give you six, but I'm stretching on some of these, okay? The first were fight, flight. Okay, so your sympathetic response starts here. Food or feeding, this is your hunger sensation. And then we get into the awkward one. I'm going to call it the find a mate. Yep, <laughs> instead of fornicate or the other bad one, uh, <laughs> sex drive. Okay, 
Then these other two are really a stretch. Okay. Thirst. Feel like those aren't Fs. Thermal regulation. Okay. Are you thirsty? And thermal regulation. You just have to mispronounce them. And then they're six Fs. <laughs> Little kids like, I'm thirsty. All right. I'm secondy. All right. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, I would. I think I did it to my kids. Okay. All right. So that's the job of the hypothalamus. And I want you to m mention here hormones. Exclamation point. Holy smokes. This dude is creating hormones. Um, and I want to talk just briefly about this guy who's not really part of the brain but is hanging down here on the brain that's the pituitary gland it is the um pretty much it is the uh gland that is entirely in charge of Sweat. your endocrine system it tells your other endocrine glands to produce the testes, the ovaries, the paracrine glands, the thymus, the, the thyroid and parathyroid. It's the one that tells all the other ones to do stuff. But it answers to, guess who? Hypothalamus. Hypothalamus creates hormones that regulate this. So even the, the gland that is largely in charge of the entire endocrine system has to answer to the hypothalamus. Okay. Then we get into just a simple structure. Okay. Very easy to find. Large structure. And you can find it in a number of different portions of the brain. From a lot of different angles. Pretty much all the angles with the exception of this one here. And that is this thing I just mentioned, which was the what? Corpus callosum. I had to look this up second hour. Corpus, I remember, it just means body. It's like corpse and, and, and things like that. Um, but callosum, what is the root word of callosum? Callus. Callus, yeah. And it's the same as like calluses in your hand. It literally means a hardened body. Because the rest of the brain is kind of squishy, but this portion of the brain is really rigid because it is a tightly packed band of axons. This cut right here across likely severed billions of axons that were going from the right hemisphere of the brain to the left. Then the brain is like the earth divided into hemispheres. Okay, This is, this is one hemisphere, this is the other. Uh, from this angle, it looks like this would be the left hemisphere and right hemisphere. And here is the corpus callosum that attaches the two. I probably should have drawn the lines going the other way because they're, they're actually going to be passing across here. Axons are just axon upon axon upon axon. What color is this band, gray or white? White, because that band represents axons that are what? Myelinated, Myelinated covered in fat. Okay. So they're going across there, connecting the two hemispheres of the brain. Okay. So that's a very simple description here. Corpus callosum. Joins two cerebral hemispheres. Okay. So it just... It's just the messenger back and forth from the left and the right? It is. It is. Between the left and the right side of the brain, it's just the connections that exist between them. It is just a giant bundle of axons. Okay. Now there we have, uh, and we're going to end on this today, is the limbic system. And it's it's a system within the brain. And its its summary is going to be this. Emotional center. But again, it is, it is still a matter of debate of what portions of the brain are included in it and which ones are included in this, but they're also a part of something else. So this is somewhat ambiguous, okay? But I'll tell you things that are for sure and agreed upon that are in there. 
first is something called the cingulate gyrus. Yeah, all within the limbic system. So we're going to have, I think it's five things we're going to include here. Cingulate gyrus, which uh, is easily seen right here in the, in the, um, that's what I had labeled. Sorry about that. Oh, yeah, here we go. Cingulate gyrus in this is these guys right here. They're at the base of this long groove. And this is gross, but you could stick your fingers all the way into this groove of the brain and they would go about this, this knuckle deep in there. Okay, because there is a groove that goes all the way uh, uh, separating the two hemispheres called the longitudinal fissure. This is right at the base. The tips of your fingers would be touching that if, you went, if your fingers went all the way down into the corpus callosum. You shouldn't do this to a live person. That would be impolite. Um, but that's the cingulate gyrus right there. A better view of it is here because it loops all the way around. This is cingulate gyrus as well, both of these dudes here. Cingulate gyrus. Um, in addition, there's this little loop down here called the para hippocampal gyrus down there and it's also these little dudes right here on the inside uh, the medial portion of the temporal lobe um, para hippocampal gyrus what is gyrus again what's a gyrus who made a model of the brain for your project or is making a model of your brain? What's a gyrus? Yeah, it's the it's the bumps. We've got the we got bumps that go up and we got the little the we got ridges and we've got grooves. The grooves are the sulcus or sulci and the ridges are the gyri. That's why this is a gyrus, it just bumps out here. Okay. So that's another portion of it. The main portion of it is oh, parahippocampal, parahippocampal. That's this guy. What does cingulate mean? I think cingulate just refers to it being well. No, that would be with an S. Hmm. The one we wrote with the limbic system, cingulate gyrus? Yeah. You know what? I'm not totally sure what cingulate means. Let me see if I can find that for the end of the hour today. Um, my instinct is saying, oh, yeah, it means one, but no, there's two of them, and singular is spelled with an S, even though... Before AT and T was AT and T, they were singular with a C, which confused people. Oh, so that's just a name of something. That's not like it doesn't mean. To yeah, something? as far as I know, yeah, okay. I'd have to look up and find out what singular I it was means. Like an action or something. Like no, it, it's, it's not. To, to it's like regulated or something. That's what I was wondering. Oh, okay, well, and it might be. We we'll have to find that out. These are the main portions of the limbic system. So most of what we associate with emotions are here. Now, there's a little bit more specifics where this is concerned. Uh, I'm going to add these dudes here. Olfactory bulb, which was cranial nerve, not cervical nerve. Cranial nerve one. And it is our sense of what again? Smell. Very closely tied into the limbic system. In fact, it's part of the limbic system tied into these things. No filters. No thalamic filters, which means that a lot of times smells can take us all the way back into memories with no time lapse in between. And a lot of times can invoke an emotion of one or the other, like coffee for me is pleasant because a lot of good memory is associated with coffee. And we made cinnamon rolls this weekend, my grandma's recipe, and smelling them baking in the oven 
made my heart feel good. <laughs> so, yes, lots of emotions that are associated with smell because there's no filter in between the two. Speaking of no filter, there is Amy G. Dalla, otherwise known as the amygdala. The amygdala is responsible for, and again, to our best understanding, rage, fear, and sadness. Rage, fear, and sadness associated with this. You know he has his ruler named Amy G. Dalla? That's the, that's the pink one, right? Yeah, and then he comes around, and if you ever have your head down, he'll slap it as hard as he can on the table and scare oh. the crap out of you. Well, that's unpleasant. I'm assuming that you've experienced that. Yeah, or he'll take his water bottle and come and spray you. And that would invoke a lot of rage, and that's in this area right here. I got to spray him back there one time, so it's okay. Yeah? How yeah. did that work about? I want a bit, so I got to soak him. Sweet. Okay, we're just about ready to go. Okay, I've got one more thing here. So the amygdala is this end right here. Oh, wow, that's the bell. Last thing is the hippocampus, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. Viewers at home, the hippocampus is this region right here. And it is associated with memory. New memories are formed, and short-term memories are turned into long-term memories because of the action in the hippocampus.